Back live at the Kennedy Space Center, you're looking at the mid-deck of the Space Shuttle Discovery. Shiaki Mukai in the foreground, John Glenn in the middle, Pedro Duque in the background there, two suit technicians, contractors and or NASA employees helping them get into their suits, check out their communications gear, make sure they're comfortable, buttoned in, and ready for orbit. I'm joined here by Walter Cronkite. We've been talking all day about then and now and the differences and the, the space on board this uh, shuttle is truly remarkable compared to, as you put it, the insertion of an astronaut some 36 years ago. Yeah. Big difference, isn't called, it? Called it in inserting them, but, yeah. which they did. They slid them through that little tiny hatch and right into the seat that's been built for them. Not it was an insertion, hardly. They didn't walk in like they do today. Not for the uh, claustrophobic, certainly. Well. All right, we're joined by a new, another guest uh, this afternoon, Dave Wolf who is a NASA astronaut. Great to see you, Dave. Dave, uh, you, he, had, he had to insert himself into Mir. <laughs> <laughs> he spent uh, four and a half Mir months on the uh, Russian space station Mir. He's back uh, firmly on terra firma and joining us to help us talk about how they're getting ready for launch. Dave, great to have you here. So far, Pleasure. so good. Everything seems to be going smoothly. We should you? have said Drasvichy. Drasvichy, Kanesna, of course. <laughs> or and pass the can Russian. perch, maybe. I don't know which. But tell me, perch, yeah. how, uh, how are things going from your view of things? I don't think we could have a smoother launch count. The weather's essentially perfect. Uh, this is as good as it gets. Let's just uh, keep our finger crossed it stays good to a 2 o'clock on time launch. You know, it's, uh, it's actually, um, I don't know. I don't know the statistics. You tell me. Is it, how unusual is it to have a perfectly flawless countdown? Well, actually, we've had... On the, if you look at the paper, things like oh, a light bulb or something that's uh, not important, uh, a few ground pieces of equipment that have uh, showed minor errors, it's not absolutely 100% flawless, nothing of any concern toward the launch whatsoever. But this is as good as it gets. I'd say uh, one in three is this clean. Really? That's, that's pretty remarkable. Now, we're looking at a shot Keep here. Keep our fingers crossed. We we're striving for 100%. Now, uh, <laughs> this is just exceptionally good. Uh, uh, hard to beat. And now this shot right here, which is coming at you from the top of the cockpit, looking down. To the right, we have Commander Kurt Brown. To the left of your screen, pilot Steve Lindsay. Right in the middle, Scott Parazinski, the flight engineer. Sitting beside him is uh, Steve Robinson, who... Uh, now, we know, uh, we were just talking a few moments ago about Scott Parazinski's role as the flight engineer, a critical role, right, monitoring critical systems. Role. He can see a lot of instruments that the pilot and the commander cannot. What will Steve Robinson be doing on the ascent? Uh, on the ascent, Steve Robinson will be, he has a good view of the three CRTs, cathode ray tubes, essentially display units that are in front of uh, the three people you see very clearly there, uh, the main CRTs on the instruments. And he'll be monitoring systems. He has his own eye trained on particular parameters, such as is the purge helium that clears the explosive gases from the seals in the main engine so they don't back up into the engine. Is that pressure maintained? Uh, that's very critical, and he'll have his eye on parameters such as that. Now, as we look at that suit technician, now it's hard. We once again have to orient ourselves. It's like being in a fun house or something. But the bottom line is the suit technician is standing on what would be an instrument panel, right. uh, which would be normally upright. What do they do to protect those instruments, Dave? Uh, that's right. There's a set of platforms. Now, that's an ascent support person, and I can't see who it is here, but likely one of our astronauts. Two of them uh, would be helping at this point in time. But there's a set of panels made to fit that part of the cockpit. Now, it looks like the floor. We're looking straight down, but really that's the back wall of the cockpit looking back into the payload bay of the orbiter. Now, those doors of the payload bay will open almost immediately upon getting into orbit. All right, now we're going to break away from our anchor position for a moment because John Zarella is somewhere on the compound with a couple of people who have some uh, interesting demonstrations for us. Spacesuits then and now, we'll call it. John? That's right, Miles. We're just talking about the uh, closeout crew, and we have here with us Ray Villalobos, and Ray is one of the members of the closeout crew. And Ray, you've got the modern-day space suit on here. This is what the astronauts launch and re-entry suit they'd be wearing today with that helmet, correct? Correct. This is the suit that John Glenn will be flying today. We were a little concerned about how hot you'd be out here in this. You're okay? I'm very well, very comfortable. Now, I want to break away just for a second and give you a look at what this is the suit. This is a test suit that Gus Grissom would have worn about 38 years ago. And Stephanie Walker is here. And Stephanie, you design spacesuits, the old and the new. And your job is to make sure we keep up with the latest trends and the development of suits. That's right. Uh, we work at Johnson Space Center. I work with Ray on the development of the launch and entry suits. Uh, I also work with the group that does the EVA spacesuits or the white spacesuit. Uh, we're all in the same group. 
What have been some of the major innovations besides color in the last 38 years? Well, the first thing you notice is, of course, the color. The old suit was an aluminum-coated uh, nylon and rubber suit, and that was so that the heat from re-entry would be re reflected away from the body. We now are going to an, a bright orange suit because the suit is primarily a uh, emergency rescue suit. So if the crew should have to uh, bail out of the shuttle, the bright orange shows up very well out in the ocean. And it also has all the survival gear incorporated into the suit instead of in a separate pack so they can actually parachute out and survive on their own. So everything is all self-contained as yes. opposed to what they used to have to go through. Right. So John Glenn would probably be a lot more comfortable in the suit he's in today than the one he would have worn 38 years ago or no? Um, yes, in some ways, and no in others. Uh, the safety is improved, but the old Mercury suits were custom-made for the astronauts. They're built specifically to their dimensions, and John even mentioned that if you gained weight or lost weight or built up muscles, they had to rebuild the suit because of it. We no longer custom-make suits. We have 12 sizes, and we adjust the suit to fit the crew members. We can take up the arms and legs within those sizes. I want to thank both of you very much for taking time. I know Ray wanted to chat with you. You are a member of the closeout crew. A lot of times, Ray would be out there, Miles, actually the last man to see the astronauts before they close the door. That's Ray's job out at the pad. This is John Zarella reporting live. Back to you, Miles. All right. Thank you very much, John. We appreciate that little demonstration. We're back up at the closeout room, the white room, and it looks like they're getting ready. Dave Wolf, tell me what they're doing there right now. It looks like they're taking some kind of seal off. I don't know, maybe you missed it, but uh, nevertheless, they're getting ready, the preparation is getting underway for closing the hatch. How soon will that That's happen? right, those technicians are standing in the white room. They're preparing, uh, the door will close. They have to make sure there are no loose objects in this area, that the seal around that hatch is perfectly clean. There's an O-ring there, a red O-ring going all the way around that has to be absolutely airtight, of course, once we're in orbit. This whole white room will retract in the 10 minutes or so, 20 minutes before the launch. We'll hear that later. And it will undergo a lot of stress. We have to make sure no objects can come loose in there. So, uh, you know, folks, it's like a jetway, sort of, shuttle. Exactly, right. well put. All right, let's go, let's go to the World Wide Web if we can for a moment. CNN.com slash Glenn is a great place to stay up to date on this launch and learn more about it. Uh, one of the things we have on here are these IPEX pictures. Take a look at this, Dave. This, and, and Walter, this is a 360-degree view of the uh, cockpit. This is actually a shuttle simulator in Houston where this was shot. You can look up, you can look down, and you can look around. And, Walter, we, we had a little simulator run not too long ago. It's a pretty impressive piece of machinery, isn't it? Oh, indeed it is. Uh, you can't believe the complexity of it, of course. The, the number of switches, the number of readouts, the number of the monitoring equipment, it's just... It's, it, it's baffling that anybody can master it to the degree that they can respond to an emergency situation, but let, right. alone, let alone fly the thing. Flying it to a landing is uh, something, uh, isn't they? They, they? they come down at a 20-degree angle as opposed to... What, That's right. A, Twice as steep as the steepest jet approaches and, yeah. and the fastest landing aircraft that there is, or yeah. glider particularly. But it takes a whole team, as you say. Uh, no one person really can master every bit of the orbiter and the payloads, and that's why we fly seven-person teams, and there's a, this is a, a world of specialty now to some yeah. degree. And it would be, uh, I think we'd be derelict if we didn't mention that, that uh, in front of every space uh, station, uh, including the pilot and the command pilot, there is a whole book of instructions as to what to do in case of, of emergency. Exactly. Turn to very quickly uh, the instructions in case you metal, reference metal materials. You slip a cog at the mo at right moment. Now, the International Space Station raises this to an even further degree. It's uh, much bigger yet with even more systems and payloads to operate and less time to train per unit time in flight. Yeah. So we have to overcome that through training right. on board. We're back in the right r white room right now as they continue their final preparations. And I do want to show folks the mid-deck uh, on that same technology, that IPEX 360 degrees. This is the view that John Glenn will see on his ride uphill, as astronauts call it. Nothing but a bunch of lockers, right, Dave? Well, it may look that way in this picture, but in the real orbiter, those lockers are replaced by scientific experiments, uh, very complex gear. Inside them is the essentials of both living and conducting the research on board. And as you can see, the, his seat would be right in the middle there, right about where that looks like a stool or some part of a seat is. And uh, you can come on to CNN.com slash Glenn and find your way to this IPEX image and uh, take your own self-guided tour.
the space shuttle, the flight deck, and the mid deck. Let's go back to some live pictures of what's going on on Launch Pad 39B. And before we do that, however, we're going to uh, take a uh, quick break here uh, as we continue our coverage of the launch of Discovery. We are now counting down one hour, 28 minutes, 17 seconds to launch. Stay with us. <laughs> 